Good evening, guys. The flipped classroom lecture tonight. It's going to be a quick one, uh, but we're introducing something called levels of analysis. We're going to go over uh, how we're going to take them, which is Cornell notes, uh, how to quote evidence, which is something we need to practice on, and then what it is you're going to be looking for. Uh, a lot of you assumed that because we had read the book once and then not talked about it for a couple of days that we must have been done with the book. Uh, I see how you could make that mistake, but believe me, we have at least another two or three weeks looking at this book in greater detail. We've done one very quick read-through. Now we're going to go back and dig down, look in, and actually try to find some things uh, at a deeper level. Um, so levels of analysis, meaning we're starting on our surface level of analysis. That was up here. This was our first read. And now... We're going to start digging in just in certain places and digging down to this deeper level of meaning to see what we can find. All right, so format and expectations. As I said, we're going to do the Cornell Note style. Cornell Note style, uh, formatting here got messed up a little bit, but Cornell Note style is mainly distinguished by your page is set up where you have one third of the space over here and then about two thirds of the space over here. On the one-third side is where the quotes go, or your textual evidence. Oh, can't spell. That was embarrassing. You would think I would know how to spell with a Q. Quotes go over here, and on the other side is where your explanation or connection is going to go. These Cornell notes are designed to just look for close analysis. So we're not going to go through and look at every single thing in a chapter, but we're just going to drill down and really focus on specific ideas or themes or symbols in a chapter and look through them to find uh, some deeper meaning and make deeper connections to our actual text. Uh, sometimes when you get a Cornell note sheet, like the one that you got today, you will already have the quotes given, and as we get deeper into the book and as we do this more and you get more comfortable with it, eventually you will start finding more and more of the quotes on your own and moving forward with those. Uh, so we have uh, just a quote here I just wanted to show you guys. I, I quoted the entire thing because I would need it all. And then on this side, we're going to be focusing this quote, the analysis that I would ask of you to focus on. It's going to be focusing on diction and tone, which we're going to talk a little bit more about here in just a second. Before we talk about what we're going to look for, I want to talk about how to use ellipses correctly. So for those of you that don't remember or never did know, ellipses are those three little periods that you use to separate things. I actually don't need my quotations. Make my periods bigger. Three little periods that you use to separate things. Uh, and you use ellipses to do two things. Uh, you use them to abbreviate the text and get rid of things that you don't need. And you also use them to highlight or to focus what you actually want the quote itself to be about. So you use ellipses very strategically. Think about it, about cutting out the things you don't need, but keeping the absolute essentials. So here we have this quote from page 42, and this is a very long quote. It's one of the first times we really see Jake for who he is and see his weakness and his wounded side and his fear of the dark and a lot of those Hemingway code things coming out. And this is Brett leaving. We have this big long quote and I like the beginning parts of this because we see Brett kind of being the flirt that she is and kissing. And I like the very end of this as well where he says, I felt like crying about her and thought of walking around. But all this middle stuff in here is stuff that I'm not really going to use. I don't need to know that there was an empty glass and a glass half full of brandy and soda. Those aren't things that are important. Uh, but I still want to use all of this quote. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use ellipses to focus the quote and cut out all these things that are not essential for what I want to talk about. So this is the quote again. We kissed again on the stairs and, and I skip a whole bunch of things, but the story keeps making sense, and I went back upstairs, and from the open window, well, that's a typo there, watched Brett walking up the street to the big limousine drawn up to the curb under the arc light. 
I probably could have gotten rid of that part as well and could have crossed out all of this as well. We don't need to know that it's a limousine and it's parked under a light. I have another ellipses here. Skipped a bunch of text that time. This was the Brett I felt like crying about. The Brett that was kissing. Skip some more text. And of course, in a little while, I felt like hell again. It's awfully easy to be hard-boiled about everything in the daytime, but at night is another matter. And what I've done is, with my ellipses, I've managed to focus it on their action. So them kissing, and then Brett leaving, and how this is the part about Brett that he doesn't like, is this kissing and walking away. And then we get some of his more uh, deeper problems and about how he doesn't like the nighttime and he feels like hell all the time and we don't quite yet know what that means. Uh, but my blue underlines here are showing I've removed the, the unnecessary information and I've focused the quote on their interaction. I've gotten rid of all the garbage about the concierge and about the glasses and about him going and sitting on the bed. None of that is important. And this way, I've kept the quote, kept the transition of action, so we've seen Brett leave, and we know that that's what's making Jake upset, but I haven't had to have all that extra material. This is how you want to be using ellipses. You're not using ellipses to just shorten a quote because you don't feel like writing it. Bad use of ellipses. Incorrect use of ellipses. Unacceptable use of ellipses. What you are doing is using ellipses to remove pieces of a quote that you want to talk about but don't need those actual pieces. Remember, when we use a quote, we want to be talking about 80 to 90% of that quote. If we're not, there's too much information and we need to be taking it out using ellipses. However, you can remove too much as well. So here we have another example. Romero's bullfighting gave real emotion because he kept absolute purity of line in his movements and always calmly and quietly let the horns pass him close each time. Description of Romero's bullfighting. This one down here is a bad example. My ellipses right here are leaving out all of, all of this. Now the quote down here, Romero's bullfighting, the second quote, Romero's bullfighting gave real emotion because he let the horns pass him close each time. That quote sounds fine. His bullfighting is very exciting because each time the bull passes very close to him. But what we miss out on is what that actually entails. That he's keeping his movements calm, purity of line, meaning he's not moving quickly or abruptly or jerking around. That everything about the way he does this is almost like a dance with the animal. This description right here is absolutely essential to understanding why Romero's bullfighting has such real emotion in it. And when we take it out with the ellipses, what we've actually done is removed the heart of that quote. We've removed the thing in that quote that made it so important, that gave us so much information. This is Hemingway talking about bullfighting. This is one of those times where he's trying to describe something as true as possible. By removing all that information, we've actually taken the quote and turned it into something much less important by removing all the descriptions of Romero's ability. So this is an example of too much removal. Do not do this. Your quotes should look like the previous slide. So if you look back at the quote I had on our second slide, uh, I said we we're gonna, that was focusing on diction and tone and what I was going to look at. Uh, as we work through these levels of analysis, we're going to focus on six things. Diction, syntax, imagery, dialogue, tone, and point of view. These six things comprise, I would say, 90% of how authors do what they do and how an author can convey an idea or a meaning or a message or any of those things. Uh, and when we say diction, what we're talking about is word choice. Oop. When we say syntax, we're talking about the structure of a sentence. I think I spelled sentence wrong. I did. I'm going to fix it. 
when we say imagery, this one's important. So imagery is any visualization that appeals to the senses. So it's any sense, it's any sensory description. So imagery could actually be describing the way something smells, the way something sounds, uh, the way something feels. All of those fit under the category of imagery. Dialogue, obviously, is what people say. Tone is important. Tone is the attitude of a piece. Uh, so tone and mood get confused a lot. Tone is the attitude of a piece. So that's the attitude that the author or the narrator is taking towards something. Think about it whenever uh, your mother or your grandmother says, don't you take that tone with me because they don't like the way that you're talking to them. Tone is the way that the book is talking to us. Mood, on the other hand, mood is atmosphere. It's the, it's the way a story, uh, it's, the, it's the way the setting of a story makes you feel. Horror movies have a mood. They have an atmosphere being very creepy. Um, mood and tone are similar in that they both involve uh, descriptions and the way characters can say things or where things take place. But tone is what we want to focus on. Mood is very easy to determine. It's very easy to pick up on the mood of a piece. Tone is trickier. It's a higher level uh, analysis, and it really is important. And then the last one is point of view, and that's who's actually telling the story. This one is basic. This one has been with us since we first were learning how to read, but it is something we come back to again and again. Keeping in mind who's telling the story can tell us a lot about a character, a lot about what the author wants us to think, and a lot about how we should interpret some of what's going on as well. In addition to these big six, when we're doing Cornell notes uh, for our levels of analysis, we are also, on occasion, going to start looking for symbolism, which we'll talk more about at a later point in time. And then other times, we'll just use our levels of analysis to conduct research. And we'll maybe research a place, or a word, or why something was said the way that it was. And so all of these things uh, can show up in our Cornell notes. So on our Cornell notes, this is our imaginary paper. We have our notes. So over here on the red side is where all the quotes are going to go. And then the blue side is where all of this shows up on the blue side. So we give a quote. And then we talk about maybe the diction in that quote, so the word choice, and then how that word choice maybe creates some imagery. And that shows up next to our quote. And then the next time, maybe we look at point of view and dialogue. And then we have another quote a little bit further down, and that time we look at point of view and dialogue. And that's how we'll go through. We are not going to do this level of analysis, as I said earlier, for every single chapter. What we are going to do is jump around the book, look at how chapters are connected, look at how characters move throughout the book, and really, now is when we're hitting AP Lit. Where we were at before, our first read through, the quizzes, the, tr the checking for evidence, the finding evidence, that was all practice. So, starting tonight, which you guys have in your hands tonight, of looking at the epigraph, that is your first, what I would call, really, AP level homework, as we're just now getting into that, almost to the end of quarter one. We've been laying the groundwork for all of quarter one, now we are ready. Do not, do not do this homework in a perfunctory fashion. Take this homework seriously. These homeworks are heavily weighted and I cannot stress enough from here on out when we're looking at the book, doing this homework halfway, not taking it seriously, you're going to fall behind quickly, your short responses are going to suffer, and all of those wonderful AP grades are going to start sliding. So please take this work seriously. We will talk about levels of analysis for a lot, lot longer and continue to practice them. Uh, but do good work on these epigraph ones tonight, and we will talk about it next week. Have an enjoyable night. Have a great weekend. I will see you guys on Monday.